So investors should always be asking themselves, am I really making the most of my money? Am I, am I optimizing the total benefits that I can get from my money? And one of the important questions for us to ask in that respect is, should I be investing or should I be paying off debt and saving myself on the interest? Well, let's answer that question. Now, in my example, I'm going to be comparing investing in the stock market versus paying off a mortgage on your home, your primary residence. Now, the, although this is a very specific example, you can use these numbers or, or just replace the numbers rather for whatever investment strategy you want to deploy versus whatever debt you could alternatively pay off with that capital. So it really can be applied regardless. But this is a very common situation for investors to be in. Now, there are some assumptions that we have to make in order to do this analysis. We have to assume what we know about inflation and interest rates. Inflation is actually a really important part of this discussion and is oftentimes overlooked. So we need to make sure that we make some reasonable assumptions about it and interest rates, and likewise, some reasonable assumptions about investment returns. So for example, right now inflation is running at about 3.5%, which is very high compared to where it has been over the last couple of decades where it was more closer to 2% or so. Now, uh, I, it, I suspect that part of the reason why inflation is high as it is right now is that this is, I'm recording this the year after the COVID pandemic. Uh, so we're it, it's, it's probably a little bit inflated and I suspect that it's probably going to go down. So for the purposes of this video, and we should always think about these things as we need to reevaluate this on a regular basis, but for now, I'm going to assume that inflation does settle back down a little bit, but I'm going to keep it. So let me just jot this down here. But I'm going to keep it as inflation around 2.5%. Uh, and we're going to say that uh, interest, and here I'm going to use mortgage interest. So right now, uh, you could get a mortgage depending on uh, credit and where you're at and so forth for about 4.5%. So those are the numbers that I'll be uh, using here trying to be reasonable. Th this, in fact, would be, as you're doing this analysis for yourself, it'd be a great opportunity to pull in a a impartial third party and ask them because we're essentially trying to predict the future where we, since we only have history to guide us, it's the only information we have available to us. And it's always good to have a second opinion just to make sure that you're being reasonable and realistic and not making bad decisions because you're making really poor uh, assumptions. Uh, investment returns, I'm going to actually use the average return of the S&P 500 over the last 30 years, which has been about uh, 12%. The S&P 500 is a good benchmark for the stock market, certainly, and it is very difficult to beat. So the, this is one that professional managers all over the world would love to be able to beat this, beat it on a regular basis, and most of them are unable to do so. So I, I think that that uh, uh, gives us an optimistic, but still a realistic uh, rate of return for the investment alternative. Okay, so let's think about this. Uh, I'm gonna run through a scenario where we really think about what does the mortgage actually cost? Because it, it's not as easy to say than just what's your interest rate. It's a, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. And what are you actually likely to make in stock market returns? So, so let's start actually with mortgage interest first. So mortgage interest, as I said, uh, let's say that you, you got a mortgage for, uh, let's see here. So you got a mortgage for 4.5%. Uh, However, I mentioned that inflation is at 2.5%. So, uh, which it seems like a reasonable assumption for me. Now, when you take out a mortgage, you're basically borrowing someone else's money and you are gonna be paying it back in the future. So because that money is not yours that you were using to buy the asset of the house, that means that you're on the beneficial side of inflation. Inflation penalizes savers and investors and it benefits borrowers. It's, it's a good thing. That's when governments should be uh, borrowing money if they can at low interest rates when they're expected to see inflation in the future. Uh, and the same thing is true for individuals as well. So as a general rule of thumb. So we'd say, okay, well, uh, my mortgage interest rate is 4.5%, but uh, inflation is 2.5%. So if I subtract these, so if I subtract 2.5% from the uh, 4.5%, then I get a real interest rate here of about 2%. Okay, so so that that's what we want to do. We, we want to do. We want to to use uh, 
returns as well as our costs in, in real terms, which is an expression that economists will use to describe uh, an interest rate minus the inflation, the inflation effect. Okay, so now let's do the other side of this equation. So stock returns, as I mentioned, the long-term stock return on the S&P 500 is about 12%. Now we have to do the same thing here. We're gonna subtract inflation because here you're using your money and you're basically giving that money to someone else or a company in this case, or companies in this case, uh, they're gonna use your money and then you're gonna get a return on it and well, as well as your capital eventually back as well. So that means that they are the ones who are basically benefiting from the value of inflation and you are the one who is suffering because of it. So we're gonna subtract that 2.5% and that gives us a rate of return uh, in real terms as well. So here we would say that comes out to be 9.5%. Uh, so 9.5%. So now we have a real return versus a real cost of our mortgage interest versus stock returns. And it, it might seem like we're doing the same, same thing on both sides, so why does it matter? Well, it, depending on what interest rate you're talking about, it can make a huge difference, especially in uh, the proportion of the uh, cost of your debt relative to inflation is, here it's dramatic. But let's say it was a credit card rate. Well, the average interest rate on credit cards right now is about 16%. So the inflation benefit that you get is a lot smaller relative or as a proportion of the total cost. So that, that's why we have to account for that at the same time. Okay, so let, let's do an example where we're going to uh, compare. Uh, well, what are the alternatives here now, now that we know? Now, before I even dig into this, the, we, we're making some big assumptions here, and we could go into really complicated ways of really analyzing the present value of that future capital, that future opportunity. Uh, however, because we're making some big assumptions about the future, it's not worth it for us to make this more complicated than it already has to be. In fact, we could probably end the analysis right here. The When there is that big of a difference between paying off debt versus uh, investing, such as the, the one we saw on the prior uh, slide, the, it, it's almost a no-brainer that as long as losses in the investment, the potential catastrophic losses, which do happen sometimes, as long as that does not have a negative impact on your quality of life and your time horizon is long, meaning in years, not in months or weeks or uh, trying to generate income and live off your investing or something like that, then it becomes almost a no-brainer. That's what we're trying to evaluate here. We're never going to be able to bullseye the actual difference in the, the benefits of paying off debt versus investing when we're trying to make assumptions about the future. What we're trying to see is, is there a huge difference or is there a very small difference? If there's a very large difference, then the decision is probably fairly obvious, especially if you work for an employer, for example, it is a 401k match that would ramp up your uh, returns. The, uh, if there's a very large difference, then it becomes almost uh, a, a no-brainer, assuming, again, that it does not affect your quality of life if you have short-term setbacks in your investing, because there's always another 2008 or uh, 2000, 2020 around the corner. So we have to be able to make sure we have a time horizon that's long enough to avoid that being a real spoiler in our, uh, our overall investing strategy. However, to continue, let's talk about why th that bigger difference, why it makes such a big difference in uh, the decision. So again, I'm gonna start with uh, the comparing uh, the savings that you might get from paying off your debt earlier. So here's an example. Let's say that you had borrowed uh, a mortgage. You, you borrowed $165,000. So that's not a huge one, but we'll, we'll go with that. And uh, that mortgage is at 4.5%. I'm just going to stick with the nominal interest rate in this case for this example. Okay. So 4.5%. And let's say that you've decided that you're going to pay an extra uh, $200 per month on that mortgage. Well, I, I ran the numbers on this. It's actually pretty good. It cuts the uh, interest or it cuts your mortgage off by nine years, which is great. And if you subtract the uh, money that you spent or, or would have spent in interest from the, the amount that you've saved, we wind up to with a savings here of about $50,000. Now, 
here again, you don't get that $50,000 right at the end of your mortgage. It's something that accumulates over time, that you're saving over time. We're not going to adjust for that. It would be too long and complicated to be very useful here, again, since we're making such big uh, uh, assumptions. But that, that is pretty compelling. So uh, $50,000 savings by making $200 a month extra in payments. That sounds pretty good, actually. Now, however, uh, let's say that uh, st now stocks have an advantage here because they your, your returns compound. So uh, meaning that every time you invest, well, the returns on that investment, when it's reinvested, it earns another return. So if you were putting in $200 a month, so let's assume that. So you're starting with zero and you're going to put in $200 uh, per month in an investment account and see what happens. Now, if you were to do this over the same period of time, it basically means that you'd be investing $72,000 over time in the stock market. So you didn't invest the whole 72K right up front, you're doing it over time. And over that period of time, because stocks compound, if you were to actually calculate this out, which I did, uh, you would have a return above and beyond. So this is the gain above your 72 grand that you put in. Uh, you'd have a gain of 334 thousand six hundred and seven dollars now that that assumes we are assuming here that you were able to get a return and here i am going to adjust it for uh, inflation of 9.5 percent on average so you had a long time horizon you put in 72k you got uh, both the 72k back plus three hundred thirty four thousand dollars extra clearly that this is what i mean by when we're when we do our analysis if we see a big difference between those interest rates then it makes a lot more sense to say oh well uh, I can maintain my lifestyle. It's not going to impair my my lifestyle or my quality of life. Uh, if I have some setbacks in my investing, it's almost a no brainer that investing is probably the better way to go if I can if I can afford that. Okay, so uh, let's take this one uh, step further. The, there are other things for us to think about. I keep hinting about this, but they are critical and they are very often ignored. Uh, the first one, of course, is the time horizon. Now. Uh, there is no magic number that uh, you can rely on to say, okay, th this is how much time you absolutely have to have. There's lots of rules of thumb out there. I would say that your time horizon has to be at least 10 years. So uh, if you are uh, looking at investing strategies and you know that setbacks in your investing would not only affect your quality of life, but may put your quality of life at risk in danger, maybe where you live in danger, uh, that that's a problem because the, the you have to make sure that uh, that you've got enough time uh, that it's not affecting you in order for those averages to really come into play. So I would say 10 years is a minimum. Everybody's got a little bit different, but it's going to be rare for you to find an investment anal analyst who would say any shorter than 10, year, 10 years. And in fact, anything, even at 10 years, you'll find a lot of investment managers will say, oh, well, forget the nine and a half percent you got to put a lot more into fixed income that has a maturity in 10 years so that you're you're reducing your portfolio volatility over the lifespan of that portfolio a lot. Uh, as an example, if you were saving for children's education where the risk of not having that money in 10 years is, is serious. Well, if that were the case, then you got to reduce that number quite a bit on the uh, the how much you are expecting to make because you're going to need to be a lot more conservative. Second thing here, and this is one I find investors very oftentimes overlook because they want to focus on the end result, how great it's going to be to have the money to be able to harvest the benefits of actually being an investor. But quality of life while you are an investor is significant. Now, I'll share a little story from early in my professional life. I remember the day that I paid off my mortgage and I got a reconveyance sent to me by the title company in the mail. I, I had, was driving with my wife. And I was opening the mail and the, I just remember this so vividly. I opened it up. We, we had to stop because it was it was just such a, a, a wonderful time. There is no monetary value I can put on that experience of getting that reconveyance in the mail. It, it meant it was valuable to me beyond the value I could have gotten from alternative investments. So you have to keep in mind that if you were able to maybe do both, well, you might be able to make up for the, the opportunity cost of not being fully invested as much as you can for the quality uh, benefit that you have in your life. Now, not everybody is going to be like me. I'm just using that as an example. So you may be very much like me or you might be quite the opposite. But don't ignore that part of the, uh, of the decision. Now, the last one here also gets ignored. And I'll confess, 
it infuriates me a little bit when I see a lot of brokers these days, and it used to be mostly just the over-the-counter dealers, offering to fund your brokerage account with a credit card, uh, which makes me a little crazy. Because the problem is, so the reason why the, the example that I've used in this video uh, works and is as dramatic as it is, is because it, it's pretty easy to compare a very low cost mortgage with, which doesn't really affect you a whole lot, with a, a, the potential for fairly attractive returns in the stock market. The delta there, the difference is very large. However, if you are, uh, with, if you have other kinds of debt, they, it makes it, it's a lot more difficult to tell the difference. So student debt, if it's at six to seven percent, something like that, that that might be a trickier one to do the comparison. The delta there may be a lot closer. Or in the case of a lot of credit card debt, well, I know that the average credit card interest rate right now, and this has been the average for quite a while, is about 16%. Now, credit card interest rates do not fluctuate as much as, let's say, mortgage interest rates do. You, you would think that credit card interest rates would go down quite a bit when mortgage rates do, but they do not. So they, they'll dip a little bit, but it kind of depends on who you are, how long you've had credit, what your income level is, and so forth. But 16% and all of a sudden that comparison gets flipped around where it is obviously better to pay off the debt where you get a risk-free return by not having to pay that interest in the future compared to taking risk that gives you a lower expected yield. So being realistic about what we're actually comparing here is just as important as the comparison itself. Now, regardless of what those numbers are, however, you can plug them into the analysis that we've done today and think about, well, if, if I'm having to pay a little bit more of a mortgage interest rate, or maybe you're able to pay a little bit less of a mortgage interest rate, the, or, or, or whatever debt it is, or whatever investment opportunity or strategy that you're looking to employ, the method remains the same. And it gives us a, a way to impartially and unemotionally consider, should I be an investor or should I be paying off debt and then become an investor?